as we continue in the sermon series, uh, I realize I keep quoting from this book by Gregory Boyle, and some of you may not have read the book. You should. It's a great book called Barking to the Choir. And I've often thought, why this book, right? I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's, uh, the title comes from, uh, from Greg, Gregory's work uh, in Los Angeles with Homeboy Industries and all of the ex-gang um, uh, members that are part of that ministry, right? And one of the guys came in one time and said to him, you know, working with you, G, this is what they call him, working with you, G, is like barking to the choir. And he looked at him and he said, what are you talking about? And he says, you know, barking to the choir. And it dawned on Father Greg that what he was doing was combining two thoughts, barking up the wrong tree and preaching to the choir. So he had put these two things together. And he asked him, is that what you mean? And he said, of course that's what I mean. That's what I just said. So the title, <laughs> barking to the choir. Would you join me as we continue in this time together. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. When Father Greg Boyle reaches out to his homies at Homeboy Industries to check in to see how they're doing, they will often answer, Aquino Mas, poorly translated from the Spanish, just right here. They will say, just right here, washing my face, or just right here, staring with my son and I'm winning the staring contest, or just right here, drawing Winnie the Pooh for my daughter, or just right here, watching Jerry Springer. Aquino Mas, I am just right here. I am living in the now, living in the present moment. Father Greg continues, Jesus would insist that we are saved in the present moment, just right here. So we choose to practice dwelling in the present moment because of his call to us. To live in this present moment, we need to find ways to establish ourselves here and now. The Buddha teaches that life is only available in the here and now. Jesus didn't teach much differently. We hold out for happiness, for healing, for transformation, always awaiting a few more conditions that need to be met. This is the one reason that happiness eludes us, he continues. We still think it's just around the corner. Think about this. It seems so simple if you anchor yourself in today, you will not worry about anything else. If, you, if your anchor is not centered in today, then you will be blinking and missing the delight of each and every moment, which is always with us as a perfect teacher. Think about the lessons that we learn by li living in the present moment. We aren't furrowing our brows with a look of self-inflicted pain or launching into a diatribe about something that's gone wrong in the past, disappointments and struggles. We aren't even dreaming about a future hope or about something in our lives that will come to be actualized somewhere, sometime down the road. We're just right here, right now. On Friday, I had that experience. I wanna tell you, I experienced paradise all day long. I got up at 5 a.m. and I drove to Solon, Ohio to be with three of my six grandchildren. Susan and I usually take this trip together up the road early in the morning, but she was staying home with the dogs, both of whom have gone through surgery, another story for another day. Driving north at 6 a.m., I was able to watch the sunrise over Ohio. It was magnificent. In case you're not aware, we live in an absolutely beautiful state. It is gorgeous. And there I was, arriving around 8 a.m. and found my oldest son with his hands in the dishwater, washing the plates of breakfast for the kids. His wife had gone to work. I gave him a big hug from behind and he 
He didn't come out of the water right away, but then when he did, he took his hands and put them on my face and kissed me. So I was all wet, and now I needed to dry off. I gave him that hug, and I went to the living room and began what would become six hours of day long until their father came home and told all of us around two o'clock that we had to go out and see the day. It was a nice sunny day. So all of us sort of shook our heads and say, fine, dad. We went outside. Then I realized, oh, he's their dad. Then as my internal battery was just about worn to the bottom, my two and a half year old granddaughter arrived home from preschool. She came running up to me, threw herself into my arms at full speed, and then for the next three hours directed my every move, just what she wanted me to do. Blowing leaves with a leaf blower that was three times her size. The way we do it is I'd carry it wherever the leaves were and then put it down for her to blow the leaves. She was swinging on the swing over and over. She was playing dinosaur. She was the T-Rex and I was the little compy trying to escape from my life. We were sliding down the slide. We were playing dolls. We were playing hide and seek. And then her baby doll was sad. So I held the baby doll and she said, no, Papa, you're too big to hold the doll. Just wait. Then she ran into her room, got another doll, which was the right size for the mother for the baby doll, and returned and the mother doll held the baby doll. And that's how it's done. <laughs> now my son and I watched the Guardians beat the Yankees in extra innings. We were jumping all over this place, hoping not to step on kids or baby dolls. But then we sat down to a wonderful dinner. After dinner, I got in my car, I drove home, I talked to my mother, 94 years old, on the road, talked to my sister, whose age I will not say, and I got to see the sunset over beautiful Ohio. I arrived home to a day that ended beautifully. Aquino Mas, just right here, one day in paradise. In the writing we know as the Apocrypha, the prophet Baruch tells us God will show us all of God's splendor on earth. But will you be aware enough to notice? Rise, says Baruch, into the splendor. Richard Rohr once said this, we don't think ourselves into a new way of living. We live ourselves into a new way of thinking if we live fully into the moment in which we're given, we soak it in, we embrace it, we are alive in it, we are alive. And we live ourselves into a new way of thinking, and then health comes to us. In today's gospel lesson, we meet someone who is not in paradise, this persistent widow, and she's faced with an unjust judge. We often call this parable the parable of the unjust judge, but I prefer to call it the parable of the persistent widow. Thanks to Mark's bell ringing, he knows that that's all I could talk about at the first service. <laughs> it worked, Mark. Jesus is teaching about a new way of thinking and acting. He is teaching a lesson about prayer, about justice, and about relationships that are in the right order of things. He says, pray and never lose heart. As the story opens, we don't know what the widow needs, though it's not hard to guess. As a widow, scripture tells us that she's treated as an outcast. Under the law in Jesus' time, she cannot inherit her deceased husband's estate. That's right. It goes straight to her sons or to her brother-in-law. She lives at the mercy of her close and extended family. Nothing is hers. And something is wrong in their relationships because she is now cast out with nothing. Her identity has been taken away. She has no rights. She is alone and she is poor. The widow goes to a powerful judge who the story tells us is not a respectable judge. By his own admission, he does not fear God and he does not respect any person. Maybe he thinks being godless and heartless will make him a better judge. I don't know. Maybe more impartial or something like that. Whatever the case, God does not get to him. People do not get to him. But this widow gets to him. She gets to him. Even though he never gives her the time of day, the passage says. 
she gets to him because she throws a mean right punch. That's what the Greek tells us. The passage tells us in the Greek that the judge uses this boxing term to describe the widow. He says, she's giving me a black eye. The widow bothers the judge. She gets to him. She gives him a black eye, though we don't have physical evidence of this. Maybe it's metaphorical. Still, his self-interest for responding to her has nothing to do with justice, has nothing to do with equity. He just wants to look okay. He doesn't want to walk around town with a black eye and have to make up stories about how he got it. So he grants her justice to save his face, literally. Isn't that the way that justice sometimes comes? It's granted that way. It's often granted by those with power and money and law on their side who will give you, to, as an outcast person, what you need, not because they think it's right, but just to save face. Just right here, just right now, we have way too many outcasts in our world. And right here in Columbus, they are children some of whom have been cast out of schools and end up on the streets. They are young adults who are cast out onto the streets and end up in prison. And once they're cast out of prison, they end up in what is no man's land. They can't get good jobs, they can't find affordable places to live, and they lose control of their lives completely. They become real victims of a community that doesn't value them. Our outcasts are too often poor, and immigrants, refugees and widows, people of color, LGBTQIA, people, young people, women, children, all who have been forsaken and forgotten, and all who are, like the widow in the story, left alone on their own to be their own champions and their own advocates in this world, and we need to stand with them. In the face of this harsh reality, Elected and appointed leaders often speak as though they're the ones who are being picked on. And they're the ones who have their position in question when they choose not to act. Over time, in order to save face, and despite all their spitting and fuming, they will grant justice, though they're not particularly happy about it. And we'd like to believe it's for the right reasons, but even if it's not, it's done. And it's mostly because of the persistence of those who come to them with their concerns. Now I know, and we all know, this doesn't define everyone, but it does define those who use their power abusively or simply neglect to do their jobs as public servants or elected officials. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. put it this way, justice delayed is justice denied. I think our widow stopped by Coretta Scott King's house on her way to see the judge. Because when she got to his court, she wouldn't put up with justice delayed or justice denied any longer. He knew her voice, he knew her face, and he was scared of her for all the wrong reasons. But the passage doesn't end where justice is granted, does it? Remember I told you at the beginning, this is a parable about praying and never losing heart. At the end of the parable, Jesus asks, but how much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on earth when he returns? How much of that kind of persistent faith will the Son of Man find on earth when he returns? You get the feeling that Jesus didn't know too many persistent widows, or at least not enough of them. Maybe he never met the persistent justice-seeking widow that we see in this story. Our challenge is to be that persistent widow, is to stand with her and become that kind of person in the fight for justice, and to do it in the here and the now, not to wait some time when it's better for us to do it, or look back and say, I should have done it then, but to do it now. Remember, Jesus is concerned about returning and not finding persistent faith on earth. He's concerned about that. And I believe you and I can live into this persistent faith by living justly just right here, just right now. We can be the change we want to see in our lives and in our community. By changing the inner attitudes of our minds, we can change the outer aspects of our lives. We can all do this. 
Like the homies of Father Boyle in Los Angeles and the persistent widow in Jesus' parable, and yes, even my granddaughter Emran, by remembering to be persistent, by keeping after things, and by living in the present, the eternal will come, and only eternity that counts is now. Or in the words of Mary Oliver, this is the first, wildest, and wisest thing I know, that the soul exists and that it is built entirely out of our attentiveness. Pray and never lose heart. Just right here.